Hello, my name is Modrum and today I'm going to talk about the Ruined King, a League of Legends story, a game released back in November 2021. Now I'm a huge fan of lore heavy games with decent combat and this one was on my backlog for quite some time, so I figured a review is in order. First a few words about the lore of Runeterra, specifically where you can find some more information about it. It's not needed to enjoy the game, but it's a great resource to answer some unanswered questions. Riot Game features a world map on their homepage, linked down below, which showcases all kings kingdoms and states. Each location has their own set of stories, champions, videos, comics and lore pieces which go into great detail, providing you with a mostly complete picture. Going over everything would probably take hours if not days. I however recommend you to go over it after completing the game, since there are obviously spoilers contained within. You can also find additional information in-game in form of collectible notes, they are scattered throughout each map. Next up the story's premise. Rune King introduces each of the six characters sequentially, with their own tale. You initially start a journey as Sarah Fortune, setting up the events to follow, but switch to Ilari shortly after. This character slowly gathers the whole party throughout the early and mid game, and sets out to stop Gangplank and the next harrowing, a catastrophic event that would wipe out Bilgewater. Now like I already mentioned, each character has their own agenda, each has their own goal, but they also have a common ground which lets them function as a party. This resulted in a very enjoyable first half of the game. You are slowly introduced to each character get a chance to play as them and get to know each one. The whole group dynamic develops at a believable pace. The same can be said about the antagonists. They are introduced early with small cutscenes. We as an observer know more about what's going on behind the scenes, but the protagonists don't. This is very important in making the villains seem competent. The legends know of Gangplank's existence, but that's about it. They just cannot stop him early on. And it's completely fine. Gangplank ruled Bilgewater. He was a ruthless killer, cunning captain, and had what it takes to be on top of everyone. So the character and story writing is great. What about the presentation? The game starts with a beautiful 3D cell shaded cutscenes introducing us to the story and each character. This is sadly the only time we see this style of animation. All other cutscenes are done through animated 2D drawings, character portraits, or in engine. All of those are also voice acted. Side content is usually just written text. Speaking of side content, character development is kind of optional. Resting at a fire enables you to view short portrait cutscenes with voice dialogue between two characters. Completing main story segments unlocks more and more of them, which highlights the progress each character makes throughout their journey. I personally watched every single one and found them to be very well made. They expand on the group's dynamic and breathe life into each character. The other side content is usually only done through written dialogue or cutscenes without the voice acting. The actual writing for side quests is not bad and there is enough variety in here, but it did feel a bit draining, especially later in the game when you get to the Shadow Isles content. There was just so much backtracking, probably multiple hours of gameplay just walking back and forth between locations. I finished all there was to do, but enjoyed the Bilgewater quests and environments much more. You can also do bounties, but those are usually only boss fights with extra stuff, nothing amazing except one or two encounters near the endgame. Now I mentioned environments just now. The game features CRPG style maps that are connected to each other, each with their own special look and feel to them, be it the Buru Temple, the Market District, the Grey Harbor or the Watchtower District. Walking through each map for the first time felt just magical. Exploring each corner for loot, dialogue or NPCs to talk to was a joy especially early on. I really liked walking through Bilgewater and looking at all the assets. Seeing as they expand beyond the walkable path and cover everything in the background helped me immerse myself in a small part of a huge world. The camera work was especially great. Zooming out to reveal huge buildings and ships left me staring in awe. But I did have some performance issues and graphical glitches in small parts of the city. Nothing I did seemed to fix those so I had to deal with them whenever I traveled through those parts. The Shadow Isles didn't have this issue so I guess it's because of all the NPCs in Bilgewater. Something tied to environments are the puzzles in this game. I wasn't expecting to be met with so much variety here, but was pleasantly surprised. Be it a magical maze you have to traverse, statues that need to be aligned in a specific way, a text-based adventure in a dungeon, or a pattern that needs to be replicated. All of them were interesting and fun to solve. The legendary weapons you can craft later on are also tied to riddles. You need to find 3 items each to craft them, but the quest text doesn't tell you where to to look for most. They are just hints, I had a lot of fun looking for them. Now all of those locations had an amazing Austin sound design to boot, be it combat or background music while exploring. All of them were fitting and enhanced the experience tremendously. Now 
My personal favorite is the Vault of the Vasani. Next, let's move to the actual gameplay. Traversal in this game is done through WSD or mouse clicks. You can also loot and interact with stuff by clicking on them or pressing a button. You can also rebind everything. The key mapping is so flexible, I mostly found myself using the keyboard omitting the mouse completely. You can also just use a controller. This game is optimized for it. Now, when controlling a character, each features a special ability that can be used outside of combat to solve puzzles or initiate combat, providing you with bony. Some abilities are also used to reveal hidden passages or explore otherwise unreachable locations. This sounds very good on paper, but led to me backtracking quite a lot. You cannot change the party out in the world, you need to visit a rest spot. And those can be quite far away. It was common enough during late game that I just started to skip things. Thankfully they decided to keep experience spread evenly across all characters, so at least I didn't need to bring that weight into dungeons. Something you also need to know, characters are forced into your group at specific points and need to be used during those segments. I especially noticed this one during Pike's introduction. Didn't like his playstyle but I was forced to use him in a group. Next have a look at the turn-based combat. It's incredibly fun. Each character has their own moveset and role, be it DPS, support, tank or a mix of those. You have access to instant basic abilities and free cast time lane abilities. Those lane abilities can be executed in speed, normal or power lane. The speed lane decreases the cast time and damage and the power lane increases both. A very simple and fun system once you introduce zones into the mix. Those can be beneficial, like receiving a heal, or disadvantageous, like getting poisoned. But that's not all. Enemies and bosses have special mechanics. Some lose a buff when hitting them in a speed lane, some spawn zones you need to avoid and some need to get nuked before they explode. But not all is great, combat is slow. So slow in fact, you're given an option to use a 2 times speed button. Personally, I wish they also implemented a 3 or 4 times one. Because as fun as it is to fight in this game, battling the same enemy for the 20th time does get boring. However, the enemy variety is good, so that's not the problem. It's just hard to avoid encounters and you have thrown into chain battles all the time. Each character level up unlocks new abilities, perks for your abilities, gives you ability points or unlocks runes. Runes can also be obtained through special vendors and collectibles. Those provide you with an increased crit chance, healing, damage and mostly passive stuff. The abilities however have multiple tiers of upgrades, each one with a substantial boost to performance, be it through additional damage or a completely new feature when used in a different lane. You can respec both of them freely which led me to experimenting with different combos throughout the game. The system however does not provide you with a lot of depth. Still, it was nice to see a character obtain new stuff whenever they level up. Gear is also a big part of your character's strength, but was nothing special. Bigger numbers are always better. The enchantment system provided me with some flexibility and I found myself increasing the rarity of certain pieces throughout the game, but I didn't get the 10 enchantment achievement, so it really wasn't mandatory to do. You also get to craft legendary weapons near the end of the game which provide you with special perks, like starting combat with one tentacle as Ilaoi or dealing 10 more damage during stealth as Pike. Which brings me to the difficulty of this game. I started my playthrough on veteran difficulty, but found myself overpowered and bored around level 10, which is when I cranked up the difficulty to max. But this didn't change much. I never really struggled at any point in this game. Got wiped one single time because I ignored the boss mechanic, but that's about it. Now the last gameplay mechanic is fishing. It has its own gear slot with a fishing pole and lure. You can fish up either fish or treasure. Fish pieces can further be traded in for a special currency that can be used to obtain legendary gear pieces, cosmetic skins for each hero or up to 20 rune books for each character. This currency can also be obtained through bounties and selling artifacts you find throughout your adventures to the same trader. It's technically 
completely optional if you're not interested in it. I obtained enough currency to get all I wanted without fishing. Now let's wrap up the video. As for positives, the game features an immersive world, likable characters, each with their own storyline, really good writing, a great story, decent side quests, a large explorable map, fun and engaging turn-based combat, good enemy and boss variety, six unique playable characters, decent progression, you can also freely respec and optimize builds, you can find collectibles with a lot of additional lore, nearly 90% of this game is voice acted, Ruined King features an incredible sound design and Ost, you can also fish, the puzzle segments in this game keep the gameplay fresh, and you're looking at 46 hours of playtime with 24 hours of main story. As for cons, the game suffers from performance issues and visual bugs in specific locations. Ruined King is a bit on the easier side, especially for veterans. The early game was very cutscene heavy, and the mid to end game was very combat heavy. There is no post game content or alternate ending. There is a lot of backtracking, especially for side quests, and you're forced to play certain characters during certain sections, even if you don't like them. The Rune King a League of Legends story is a great JRPG with an amazing story likable characters, engaging combat and an immersive detailed world. I found myself captivated by the city of Bilgewater and wanted to explore more and more, until I was met with a lot of backtracking and combat towards the second half of this title. Still, this game is ripe for the taking for anyone looking for a story heavy turn based RPG. Anyway, make sure to like, comment and sub for more previous reviews and guides. See you next time and bye!